Welcome to Shakespeare FC, The Sonnets, a five-minute journey into the iambic abominations on life, love, death, and desire, with a smattering of nature and naughtiness from the mind of our literary epicure from Warwickshire, or, as you become more familiar, Uncle Will. I'm your host, Kari Marshall. In his sonnets, Uncle Will wrote from a very personal place about the human condition, all in just 14 lines. But in that meager space, we can find an absolute wealth of human experience that you just might identify with. So, let's you and I go on a little journey. Today, Uncle Will is having some thinky thoughts about self-restraint. Now, I've always imagined Sonnet 94 as a sort of a sermon. Now, certainly I have heard many a similar word coming from various pulpits, It is also yet another sonnet. William begins by leading us down one path that we are quite sure of, thank you very much, and then taking a sharp turn at the end. He begins the first quatrain with praise of the restrained, saying that there are those that have the power to hurt others but choose not to, those that seem to be the outward embodiment of power yet do not use it over others and to go further there are some that arouse feelings in others but remain themselves as stone detached unemotional and thus resistant to temptation they that have power to hurt and will do none that do not do the thing they most do show who moving others are themselves as stone unmoved, cold, and to temptation slow. In the second quatrain, Uncle Will says that it is these stoic people who gain favor from heaven, as they prevent all the world's treasures from being wasted. They are in control of their actions, as well as their expressions, while everyone else has no mastery of their impulses and are therefore subject to being used by others. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces, and husband nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. Then comes the third quatrain. Uncle Will employs his floral metaphor once again, saying that the summer's flower to the season is pleasing, though the flower itself only knows life and its cycle to dying. But, he says, if that beautiful flower becomes infected, then a weed, a disgusting weed, were more preferable for our Uncle Will. The summer's flower to the summer is sweet, though to itself it only live and die. But if that flower with base infection meet, the basest weed outbraves his dignity. In the final couplet, Will makes it quite clear. Even the sweetest and most beautiful of things can, through their terrible behavior and choices, become more foul than the basest of things. For William, at least, a beautiful lily that rots smells far worse than a weed. For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. I have always been drawn to this sonnet. I was introduced to it as a warm-up for a play I was in. But I've always seen this theme of virtue and a falling from grace to be a strong thread through Uncle Will's works. I'm put in mind of Hamlet's words about his mother's marriage to his uncle, an unweeded garden that grows to seed things rank and gross in nature which mirrors here how awful the betrayal because he held her, this seeming virtuous queen, so high in his esteem. So I suppose for Uncle Will, it's not just the bigger, but the better you are, the harder you fall, in his eyes at least. Well, alas and alack, my friends, that is all we have time for. Join us again next time for another hopefully informative journey into the mind of Uncle William. I'm Kari Marshall. Farewell until next time. Shakespeare FC is a production of WGTE Public Media. You can learn more and download all episodes at wgte.org slash sfc or wherever you get your podcasts.